Okay, I've I've been probably I think I've made a, a general recording on this topic before, or at least bits and pieces worked on the intellectual bits of it, but this does require a kind of standalone treatment, which sadly this won't be such a condensed lecture and uh, you know the anyway let me just start getting into it because there are very many sensitive issues here which um, I'm probably not going to treat with the right amount of politically correct care that is usually demanded but that's because my main topic is the structure of the politically correct insanity uh, which is a, a kind of um, a general kind of uh, delusional filter on reality w w which makes it all the harder to actually uh, stop the the spiral of of uh, further derangement and and you know the propounding a kind of a, a very co corrupt political culture uh, which can just continue its sort of virtue signaling bandwagon um, unaccountability and irresponsibility um, but anyway what what immediately prompts me to make this lecture is that Sam Vaughan recently touched on on these issues uh, opining on or, or giving his views and and uh, 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 presenting you know uh, a lot of the the uh, studies and things like that and, and academic work uh, uh, that touch on the issues of of you know the kind of of, of the complaint of systemic racism and the riots in America uh, over this topic, which now the ANC has joined in their, um, you know, essentially this race baiting political phenomena. Um, but I mean, uh, I mean, much of the ANC's um, political, uh, uh, political economy is essentially based on some form of this kind of, of, uh, um, uh, inane and useless esoteric conspiracy theory of systemic oppression which no doubt exists you know in some small fraction on some tiny technical level but which really does not account for for the kind of uh, degeneration and lack of opportunity and lack of progress which we have made as a nation which has um, in some sense been exacerbated by the toxic identity politics leveraged um, by this this kind of political economy that's infused with race baiting that that is in fact you know stuck into doubling down on its um unaccountable policy that that allows itself to to sort of um uh focus resources on a kind of a kleptocratic elite that use the, um their their token value that that the policy bestows upon them and because that token value is targeted towards the superficial measure of black identity and it doesn't target disadvantage, it allows them to freely, in essence, uh, use this kind of uh, seman se semantic uh, um, construction of, of social injustice to, to have their inefficiency and ineffective development policy go unchecked forever and continue to be the kind of the gravy train for, for, for the... Uh, what becomes a kind of entrenched plutocracy, which is what we kind of, we suffer from a kind of black oligarchy, essentially, which continually goes undetectable in the political uh, arena. No one talks about this black oligarchy because essentially it's just completely overshadowed by white monopoly capital, you know, so by that kind of uh, accusation, where essentially the, almost the only functioning part of society um, the, the private enterprise that is that, that manages to hold on to this you know continually eroding um, and debased uh, uh, and sabotaged economy um, that is infused with just so much corruption that never goes accounted for um, but can be dispersed into the ether with these these vague accusations of white monopoly capital um, which I'll say as well that the the corruption of white monopoly capital to the extent that it does exist is uh, by, by far the more, you know, the kind of at the behest of government because of its control of licenses and because of leveraging its, its increasing in, encroachment um, over all of industry, uh, you know, in, in sort of creating this fiefdom uh, for, for this black plutocracy, which goes undetectable by this politically correct sort of cabal. Um, 
of what you can only call vulnerable narcissism and the, the, this incredibly charged emotional political arena. Um, okay, so let's get into the politics of generalization and talk about stereotypes, as Sam Vaknin did as well. Um, let me think. I, I, I think that on some level, he didn't, I mean, in some sense, I vaguely agree with, with a, a lot of what he said. I, I think he could have emphasized something. I actually have, I didn't finish watching the second video yet. So this might be slightly premature to, to see how he ends it off. But I, I anticipate that he does not fully kind of talk about the kind of um, how, how stereotypes um, can be so functionally unimport unimportant. That in some sense, it is possible to leverage stereotypes in a way that is practically useful and, and that has essentially morally neutral outcomes or only morally positive outcomes in some sense. That in some sense, if one just constrains the use of stereotypes, which are, let's say, statistically representative of some kind of field of reality, and he shows in his studies that many stereotypes are at least vaguely correlated to what the situation is on the ground at the time, something like that, that it that stereotypes change quite quickly, in fact, and that essentially people do have a sense of, of, of generally um, making evaluations and readings on groups and categorizations. The, the thing to note about stereotypes is that, obviously, uh, they have a, a huge potential for moral iniquity, for moral corrosion, depending on how they are utilized. If one constrains the use of stereotypes, but doesn't try the stupid thing of trying to defeat stereotypes in the sense of not having them, no one can not have stereotypes. The point is, is how are they uh, uh, leveraged in some sense? And in some sense, if you're doing something that is morally uh, uh, neutral, in some sense, you're not having a conversation with someone, you're not having a discussion with someone, uh, you're not in a peaceful, tranquil context, perhaps you're in an emergency, perhaps you have to make a very quick judgment and you have to sort of try to understand what's going on. The kind of situation that police are in all the time. A kind of emergency situation because someone's life is on the line, because there's risk involved. Uh, you know, racial profiling um, in certain circumstances could probably be curtailed, but in some sense it's a natural manifestation. It's not going to, especially if there are vast disparities in statistics. In, in, in reality, in some sense, if, if, if there's a disproportionate propensity based on certain groups and, and there's a stereotype that results from that, in some sense, as long as that stereotype isn't acted on uh, 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 preemptively and it isn't pursued preemptively, but it, 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 it is used reflexively as part of a calculation, I don't see how you can really mitigate that that much. But obviously, if you're um, at a cocktail party, if you're if you're talking to someone, if you're having an intellectual discussion, there is no reason to leverage stereotypes against somebody else uh, to prejudice them in that sense, um, to prejudice their interests in that sense. Um, so, in some sense, you know the calculation of how people are being um, mistreated because of stereotypes, uh, it has to be weighed realistically, pragmatically in some sense. And I, I do think the police are in some sense, uh, uh, you know, they're where this, this ethical thinking needs to really be quite sharp. You can't expect, you know, I mean, you, you, you get this ironic, uh, this very, sorry, uh, this very kind of ironic, a manifestation where you have these black activists who are racialists at heart, who see the world in racial terms, demanding that that policemen be colorblind. I mean, can no one see the hypocrisy in this? I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. So, you know, I've looked at, uh, I, I haven't looked at all these incidents, and, and in some sense, you know, I, I think in some sense, these things would naturally not come to the kind of racialist toxicity that they come to if they were balanced, if the reporting was balanced, if every time a police officer was killed by a black assailant, and if that was put on the news, then perhaps, you know, the whole thing would be ameliorated almost naturally. But it's almost, it's, it, it, we have this artificial focus that mistakes will always be made. There will always be uh, 
uh, a policeman who who act uh, um, badly. Uh, the, the point is, is can the can the system actually deal with that? Can it monitor it? Can it self-regulate itself to some degree? And if really, if you look at the statistics, and if you look at the rate at which police kill people, um, you know, th there's nothing statistically standing out here. I mean, police officers will make mistakes, and perhaps they will act with malfeasance at a certain rate. This is just like part of humanity in some sense. Uh, and if you look at the statistically the kind of encounters uh, that police are going to uh, uh, get in with you know uh, uh, the general population at large like there's no real outlier that you can see here except if you're going to make this kind of weird kind of circular table thumped argument that oh no no it's the re somehow it's the attitude the emotional state of the police that causes uh, the disparities in, in crime statistics you know and which is which is um I mean, like, technically that possibility exists, but I mean, like, let's be serious, like, let's actually contend in, in real, you know, like, what is your actual theory about how that works, you know, the, 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 you know that, that's so delusional, I mean, it's, it's basically a bad faith argument. Um, I mean, on a societal level, if you're going to make that kind of racialist sort of argument, then at heart, you're really a kind of ethno-nationalist even to begin with, you don't really, but you know, you believe that there must be some kind of segregational, you know, uh, um, or, you know, I mean, that's the kind of argument that essentially the Black Panthers wanted, you know, their own nation, or they wanted some kind of uh, extreme version of reparations. And, you know, like, all, all this kind of talk, which is essentially some kind of like identity nationalism, ethno nationalism. Um, and it's interesting, because, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, that is essentially what they are. They have a kind of philosophy that is essentially ethno-nationalism, and then they're trying to advocate those real interests within uh, a secular nation-state that isn't um, uh, ethno-nationalist. And so, within that context, you have um, a mismatch in... Um, in politics and you've got you know you, you you've got almost these very fraudulent intellectual arguments being leveraged and being speciously cherry-picked and and you know because I was going to go into the example of the Aubrey um, uh, the, the death of Aubrey which um, uh, the, the, it, it's very interesting how legally that has been sort of broken down by the media and and how badly it's been interpreted I mean uh, so I mean, I'll just give you my rendition of the facts that are relevant in the le in the legal issue here, um, and and you can see in the in the very hollow and specious arguments that are made in favor of of making Aubrey into a martyr. So the the story goes that Aubrey did nothing wrong, but from the outside he did something that was minorly suspicious, and so because there was only sort of suspicion but no evidence of anything. Um, in particular, um, he couldn't be arrested, even though technically he wasn't being arrested. He was, uh, people were asking him, uh, well, in some sense, uh, I guess, effectively, constructively, I think you can argue that he was in the process of being in, in, in some kind of process that was, uh, uh, that eventuated in, in a form of, of citizen's arrest that was being attempted. So he was being attempted to be citizen's arrest, but that was part of a process, and, and that's part of the nuance, which is completely left out. Um, he, was, he was asked to answer questions. He was asked to, to stop and, ha and have a conversation. Running from someone asking you uh, uh, to answer some questions, that makes it quite suspicious. In fact, I would even say that that injects the idea that that the suspicion exists that the felony occurs. Because if someone wants to ask you a question um, and you know that you've done something that even ostensibly looks slightly suspicious and then you start running, then that slight suspicion manifests into something much more... Um, uh, uh, it looks like a, a much more serious kind of malfeasance. And then, essentially, I mean, the reason why uh, Aubrey died is because he wrestled a man with a gun. He assaulted a man with a gun, technically, that's what happened. He, he did the assault first. He charged a man with a gun, and he assaulted a man with a gun. So, if someone ostensibly is trying to 
conduct a citizen's arrest on you and you allow them to arrest you and you believe that the citizen's arrest was uh, unlawful or illegal, uh, then you have the police there, right there, to hear your complaint. And then you will you can get in contact with your, with, you know, so even if he was being illegally um subject to, to a citizen's arrest or a, an improper citizen's arrest or a citizen's arrest that, that was not lawful. If any of those things were happening, that doesn't give you the right to resist. That's something that is just a basic common sense fact. You, you don't have, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 what, one has a common sense obligation in some sense. To mitigate one's losses, to not, I mean, you know, to, to not self-help. You know, it's not legal to assault someone if someone is doing something illegal to you. So if someone is illegally um, arresting you, then sue them. You know, that, it doesn't mean that you get to assault them. And this is certainly wasn't a pretext for a kidnapping. I've, I've even heard that argued pathetically that, you know, you know maybe he was, a, he, he resisted them. Uh, because he thought that, uh, uh, you know, essentially that they were in bad faith and they just wanted to do bad things to him or something like that. And so he was fighting for his life. You know, I mean, like, what, I mean, that's just not reasonable. I mean, even if he did think that, which I, I doubt, I mean, that's that's a, a very stupid theory. Um, you know, but that's just not reasonable. That, that, that's, I mean, already that, 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 that that's... Uh, uh, You know, there's a level of culpability there um, that would still attach to the assault that he conducted. Because, you know, so, you know, the, the idea that if someone is, 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 is subjecting you to an illegal citizen's arrest, that that gives you the right to assault them. I mean, it's just, it's just absolutely absurd. It's, it's just, it's not even worth talking about. And the idea that, like, people can legally sort of dig into this question and make these really pathetic legal arguments as to, well, if the citizen's arrest was illegal, then all bets are off. I mean, like, what kind of anarchist system do they think, you know, society can function in if, if essentially you, you can use this supra-race politics to govern, you know, the kind of, uh, 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 to filter reality into this level of delusional derangement? Um, I mean, uh, sorry, so the, the only sort of counter argument that I've heard to this, uh, which is really the rather specious and, and stupid thing is, that, or what happens if, if someone says that they're arresting you and, and then they have a gun and then you have to sort of, and then they're actually kidnapping you. I mean, it's like, you know, well, obviously that's going to be context specific. Do they wake you up in the middle of your house and, 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 you know, you have done anything suspicious and then they say that they're arresting you and then they're actually kidnapping you. I mean, like, you know, what, what kind of stupid hypothetical reasoning? Um, anyway, um, so, I mean, the Aubrey thing is, is, is a media hyped up operation, essentially. I mean, it is certainly very unfortunate circumstances. Um, I have no idea what happened with the Floyd thing, but I mean, you cannot just keep on looking for incidents as an excuse to judge a whole society as racist. I mean, essentially, you know, if, if you cannot uh, allow one bad cop to just be a bad cop, but has to be representative of systemic oppression, you know, I mean, essentially, you can't, ha you can't have a multicultural, so you can't have a multiracial society if, if that is your standard. It, you know, if you can't even, if you can't even uh, uh, absorb that amount of of um, of, ex of, of 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 sort of uh, um, opportunistic uh, um, race baiting, you know, and, 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 and to, to trigger some kind of of, of uh, excuse to, to leverage um, some kind of uh, disgusting race baiting polemic uh, to wreak havoc on. On democracy, even on on political issues, and essentially to diffuse uh, 
you know, the root causes of these issues, which essentially are the crime statistics themselves. And, you know, I would say Larry Elder is probably correct on essentially what is causing these things. And it's sad, but essentially it is essentially the excuse of systemic oppression and essentially underachieving cultures or subcultures that essentially uh, uh, lean into this mediocrity because uh, the vulnerable narcissism is is just too expedient in some sense and you know the, the the culture itself is not able to throw out these particular um toxic individuals that propound these you know essentially the, these conspiracy theories um because i guess it's just too comfortable in some sense um you know there's something very comfortable about being told that you lived in a rigged game because then essentially it gives you an excuse to try to rig it. Um, that that then essentially you just unlock this kind of competitor drive to to get in on rigging the game before there's there's no game left with, with which to rig. And so essentially they just keep on undermining liberal values. And they keep on undermining even the notion of accountability and responsibility. And they keep on creating this, this blind, veiled, you know, murky, um, secondary intellectual economy of, of these, of these uh, excuses to throw any kind of, any sense of accountability in, into this systemic narrative. Um, and so, the, I mean, this is why they essentially are always talking about some kind of generalistic narrative. And it's interesting because they are levering, they are therefore leveraging a stereotype of the society in just the same way that they say that they are being victimized by that society by bad stereotypes in some sense. But, you know, people don't realize that essentially uh, using stereotypes about the society itself, about the narrative and using uh, uh, and 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 everyone is going to have these stereotypes but you know someone has to put them away first in some sense and i think we did put them away for quite a decent amount of time in the 90s and then suddenly it became uh, uh, academically intellectually um uh permitted uh, it became in vogue it became fashionable and so it's just sort of escalated since then. And then, you know, the, the, the deeper sort of cultural toxicity of, uh, okay. So let me continue now. Um, generalizations. Yeah. So, so this politics of appearances then becomes this kind of the shadow world where, um, one-sided you know fraud and and using cherry-picked you know sort of ex exemplars to to sustain your polemic and to disguise the the um the actual scope of the problem even i mean a lot of this is really taken out of context if you would just actually put this into the context of you know that police work is not an easy job uh, police work is very stressful and many police don't aren't psychologically you know it, it's Sadly, you know, we're, we're, our society is never perfect. And, you know, there are bad policemen. Um, there are bad actors and there are good actors. And in some sense, you know, the, a lot of this is, is being... Um, okay, yeah, okay. So, um, but, I mean, a lot of this is not even bad police work. I mean, people... Uh, I, I can't, it's, it's wrong to speculate exactly what went on, but we have to remember that, uh, at least in the Floyd situation, I, I've been told that three of the police officers that were there when this happened were black, three out of the six or something. So, you know, th there's a, uh, and, and that, in fact, that whole police, um, uh, the particular uh, police station that those police were all from is like 43% black. So, you know, this idea that like, th that the kind of racial profile, profiling that goes on is, is not even, uh, uh, that black officers aren't themselves um, uh, 
uh, what's the word, uh, develop a propensity uh, and, and can perhaps uh, uh, even be corroded by it. Because in some sense, as I say, there's some level of the racial profiling that's going to almost be instinctual. It's not going to be. But how that how that engages with your general ethical outlook on life and your general openness. In some sense, I've, I've said this before in terms of the Mitgau sort of issue, is that um, perspectives can always be a source of, of toxic conceit, of intellectual, of a kind of intellectual toxic conceit, that just because you have a point of view, a perspective, um, a reading on something, doesn't mean that that's the pure truth doesn't mean that that's the whole truth doesn't mean that it's concrete and so you know if you can still be open to persuasion or at least if you cannot take your beliefs so seriously that your beliefs are a a working theory in some sense and that you're you know so even um but i mean obviously it it depends you know the in some sense there is no truth about a generalization because what can be true about a whole group it's it's fundamentally vague it's fundamentally nebulous to which how do you subdivide that group and say because i mean obviously if it's true about the group it's not true about the individual it's true about a subset of, of members of that group and how do you distinguish between those members that involve the subset and which members don't involve the subset well you know that's like fundamentally vague about a stereotype about a generalization so you realize that within that plethora um is the human condition uh, within the complexity of that subset division. And uh, so, I mean, generally, you know, people should know that uh, generalizations hold no ethical water and they should never be used prescriptively. Uh, they, they should never be um, consciously, let's say, uh, um, brought to bear onto people in a planned way in some sense. I mean, in some sense, you can use stereotypes and you can use generalizations as a way to vaguely outline policy, maybe, you know, in the sense that you can say, well, we know that most poor people in South Africa are black. So, but should we really be targeting blackness as a way to qualify for government assistance? Obviously not, because there are many uh, black people that are middle class. There are many black people that are in the elite structures. So, so what would be the point in targeting black? Obviously, we should target uh, uh, disadvantaged. And using the one as a proxy for the other, I mean, that ex exactly is this, this, this toxic racial profiling um, to begin with. And, and in fact, that moral corruption begets more moral corruption. And it begets a kind of reactionary inculcation of, of this whole issue. Um, and so, you know, we should do what, um, oh my word, I always forget, Hugh, is Hugh's first name, Hugh Coleman, uh, as, as a, in Rebel Wisdom, spoke about this issue, about essentially, um, I can't remember the, the words that he used, but I mean, it basically means that you suspend your stereotypes. You don't leverage them. You can still have them, but you don't leverage them. You know, th that yes, we have a brain that is prone to making generalizations. We only use them when they're absolutely necessary to do so, and it, when it's only a matter of practical proficiency and when it has no, because life is too short in some sense. But obviously, if you're having a discussion with someone, you don't leverage your stereotypes against someone that you're having a discussion with. But I mean, if, if, if your decision has to do with anything that where a generalization is appropriate, then yes, you can use your knowledge about your generalizations. That isn't a problem. People make computational operations in their mind all the time like that. You know, it, 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 you have to map reality like that. Otherwise, you, you can't act in some, you can't plan in, in, in at least in, in a creative way, you can't plan because you... You have to have a sense of, of what things are going to be like in situations that, that you have to imagine. And you have to furnish those imaginations with something. And obviously, if, if your imagination, if you're dealing with that, that part of the imagination in a detailed way, then that can be very detailed. But your, your imagination is going to be in a, in a context, which is going to be in a broader context, in a broader context. And at some point, you're going to have to furnish those with generalizations. And you're going to, and hopefully you're going to have the sophistication of treating those generalizations, 
as they should be, which is that they're low resolution. They're not very reliable depending on what kind of weight, computational weight you're going to lend to them. You know, I, I, every example that I can think of is so stupid, I don't even want to say it because it just sounds so crude. But, you know, like, you know, oh, you know, there are some places in the world where it might be okay uh, to be naked because you're in the middle of the wilderness and, and you're going and, and having uh, uh, and, and swimming in the sea in the middle of the night, you know, like that or, or, or a lagoon or something like that. And there are other places where you wouldn't want to be naked in in a, in a bustling you know you, you have a generalization about what society looks like um and how society would re react to a naked person wandering around um you know you, you have a generalization of of what uh, the kinds of police officers that might confront you um if if you were in such a predicament um and how 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 would you would present yourself and in some sense if you tried to sort of excuse yourself rationally or try to give some kind of account of what you were doing how they would interpret that you know which obviously that could go in many many different ways depending on the the personal sort of efficacy of the person involved which you know i guess a policeman would probably try to sort of get you out of the street or throw a blanket over you and and then you know to cover you up and and sort of uh uh uh, uh try to work out if you were having a psych psychotic episode perhaps but um You know, generalizations tell us about, usually they tell us about places in some sense, because they tell you in terms of your imagination where you could be at a certain time of day, at a certain, in a certain kind of mood and situation and, and what things are likely to befall you or, or to happen to you. And you need that as, as a part of like a, an ability to plan reality in some sense um, in order to emulate reality in your mind. And if you and, and if you aren't allowed to stereotype, you're not allowed to make generalizations. Well, you really can't. You're not allowed to anticipate anything. Now there are, in some in some senses, what this race baiting ideology really is trying to do is it's trying to promote the sense of that you are in an emergency because you're being assaulted by this oppressive force, this collective oppressive force, and this collective oppressive force is so constrictive, and and is so dominating that you are in a political emergency and so you have to give up all your power to politicians to, to um, infantilize your identity and to look out for your identity. And that is essentially the totalitarian, tyrannical game that is being played. Um, and, and it allows elites to virtue signal their way into doing whatever the fuck they want with complete unaccountability. Um, because they only have to, to render responsibility to the identity which they could even share they could share in the identity and that's good enough that that you know because it doesn't have this um because it hasn't made the correct d distinction it, it it falls um uh it, it's it's obtuse in its treatment in some sense it can't distinguish between government policy giving a lot of money and and allowing some rich black businessman making a lot of money and and promoting opportunity and upliftment and creating an economy that's actually capable of of providing opportunity to people and incentivizing people in their already natural talents and their already inclinations and just broadening everything and broadening the base at which development can happen it's instead targeted towards the black identity and so it just disrupts everything else it destabilizes everything else it slows down everything else and you get essentially a kind of a political economy a practical economy a moral economy that is functionally completely filtered by this arbitrary distinction which has been imposed by a kind of journalistic mainstream media that is just completely entrenched into these ideological categories because they have been academically vetted somehow even though they're completely racialist um they, they proceed from racialist premises um they have got this kind of racialist spiritualism attached to it um and it, it can't stop but double down on, you know, it takes every opportunity it can to just continually sort of try to make itself look like a kind of paternalistic authoritarian that is looking out for the identity. And that's what politics has become, this kind of identitarian ethno-nationalism in this kind of transnational worldview.
Um, and it continues to create this false secondary political economy in which pressure can be diverted. Um, onto that polemic, onto that narrative, any, any kind of um, problem with political accountability can just sort of be, be redirected um, into this overarching heuristic, which is prioritized as being the expedient necessary thing. And it's sad because as this is being, as this has to be deconstructed, uh, to really understand, I mean, it, it has to be deconstructed and understood so that we can hopefully get back to a liberal democracy, which we effectively don't have anymore. We don't have liberal democratic politics anymore. We've got this totalitarian, fascistic uh, style of, of one ideology state. Uh, what, we, there's one state ideology, there's one political ideology, and there's only one game in town, and it's this rigged game. And if, if we can't disengage from that... Um, as as we're trying to disengage from that, um, essentially, the one avenue in which, let's say, it is slightly valid in some sense, would be something like um, policing, where essentially risk, real risk, is on the line in an immediate sense. Um, And I'm not talking about proactive racial profiling. I'm talking about reflexive racial profiling, which in some sense, policemen themselves will naturally generate. Even if you, even if you, told, them, if you told them nothing about crime statistics, within their own life experiences on the job as a policeman, they would develop their own intrinsic experience that would lead to this kind of racial profiling. And in some sense, that's why they might already communicate about it, they, write, they might already think about it, they, it might already be at the forefront of their minds, and they might essentially, even statistically, they might derive it themselves by just looking at FBI crime sheets or something like that, or, or crime statistics. They might uh, intellectually, preemptively work out this heuristic and, and some, some sensitivity, essentially, to some form of reflexive racial profiling. It, this is a very ugly aspect, but this is not this is not a central aspect of civilization. This is to do with policing. This is one aspect of, of a society. And in some sense, it can get better. This situation can be cleaned up. It can eventually go away. But it's not going to go away because police are forced into some kind of ideological, politically correct prison. It's when the crime statistics actually even out, which is something that very much could happen. That is something that, that is on the table, but that can't even be put on the table. That can't even be seen with any clarity because of this general systemic hysteria uh, and rationalization and alignment of facts with, with essentially this hoax of systemic oppression. And there are elements of systemic oppression, but they are so minute. It is, it is, it is actually, it, it, it exists in, in some tiny tiny fraction of i mean the uh, hugh coleman goes into this um what is it coleman hughes oh my word i'm so bad with names but um the the he wrote the the, the quillet pieces and things like that but if you just look at um you know it, the one place that it kind of exists uh that that i can think off the top of my head because there are very very few places actually is is that um in court cases where they have the stenographers that have to record um, everything that is said, uh, that, uh, I don't know what you call it, black vernacular um, is sometimes not recorded well by stenographers. And uh, let's say because that isn't transcribed properly or something like that, it, it creates a kind of systemic bias in some sense because the communication is not you know, I mean, there are actually, there are actually um, examples where essentially the words that were used were misinterpreted because the vernacular was not um, expounded on, uh, or was not elaborated. Um, and essentially, uh, the, the, the judicial officers involved, uh, um, or at least the, uh, the magistrates or the judges involved, did not actually understand 
the meaning of the words that were being used. And so they were effectively misjudged. Um, and this was essentially a failure of, of communication because the, and, and ironically, I would say that this break in communication, which happens on a, almost on the level at which the subculture tries to diverge itself from the mainstream culture, as it were, is in essence, a kind of preemptive reflexive entrenchment into this, this systemic oppression. It's, it's interesting that the complaint against the complaints of systemic oppression could literally be the only thing that almost inculcates the manifestation of any of the examples of real systemic oppression, uh, which, you know, there's not much more really. It is not actually that many substantive things other than the kind of example that I just gave. So we have to understand that essentially the systemic oppression is essentially a kind of a cry wolf sensitivity. And to the extent to which those issues, uh, uh, the prevalence of disadvantage exists, how that is not being properly tackled, it's not being properly tackled because it's being cast as a general racial polemic. It's, it should be categorized and, and targeted as a practical problem. But because it's not reduced to practical in practical terms and in practical secular political terms and it, it becomes used as this kind of iconic um, uh, 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 symbol of some kind of of, of, of sort of uh, you know these are people that need oppression in order to to functionally um, uh, maintain their cultural edifice, because their cultural edifice is fundamentally premised in vulnerable narcissism. You know, and and th that is really uh, uh, the deformity and the degener and the degeneration that you know. I mean, in some sense, you could say, "Oh, well, that's a historical that's been historically inherited at some point." Well, I mean, I, I think we also have to understand that when did this degeneration actually start taking place? And, and, you know, the Harlem was, for example, I mean, uh, um, Milton Friedman talks about going dancing in Harlem and, and, and the higher standards. I mean, how has standards gone down? It's gone down because of culture. It's not gone down because of, mater because of the material substrate. And trying to, to leverage this polemic as if it's, it's about, it's a lack of welfare and things like that, rather than focusing on culture and the cultural problems which are things that um, Hugh Coleman sort of get into and Larry Elder and things like that. You know, these things are being sidestepped to, to, to essentially create this, this, this never ending cycle of vulnerable narcissism. Um, that is a self fueling, self agonizing, self fulfilling prophecy of, of uh, um, sabotage essentially which gets redirected into the outside so that some of, of, of the, of the, um, of the ringleaders can make political hay with all this, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the Sharptons, um, and such the, the, and, and, and the whole economy, the whole sort of fake intellectual economy around it of, of you know, the, the stream of academics of, of Dyson, Professor Dyson and, um, you know, and, and all these other sort of uh, um, race baiters uh, that, 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 that hook themselves into the secondary economy, which essentially all this really does is, is it, uh, it just slows everything down. It just arrests the development of everything. And because of this, intellectual corruption essentially you're also creating a murky atmosphere in which you're, you're supporting irresponsible governments like the ANC in South Africa uh, and you're supporting a whole edifice of, of um, uh, racialist politics which essentially has no end as it continues to sort of um, devastate itself and uh, as an excuse to to get into this kind of identitarian cannibalism um, Okay, so I didn't go over, let's say, the kind of politics that it's displacing, which is important as well, the kind of the general, you know, the actual solution uh, and focusing on, you know, like how. But I, I did sort of intimate that. Um, 
by how I constructed uh, a kind of corruption that this portends. So I'm just going to leave that there. Um, yeah, people will have stereotypes and intelligent people and decent people will know how to treat those stereotypes as very dubious sources of information, but they are sources of information that you can glean things from. And usually the only thing that you can glean from them are somewhat practical things, very, very crude practical things, not precise practical um, output. And in some sense, people should also know that uh, um, stereotypes that, that they have formed by third, by hearsay, essentially, by, by, um, by also at a distance, the, the, the further you are from the stereotype, uh, uh, you know, the, the probably um, the more inaccurate, the more wildly inaccurate it is. And the more, you know, and people should obviously know that essentially um, stereotypes generally hold a wealth of, 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 of secret treasure of information, which is, um, which is locked away by the stereotype. And in some sense, if people treat stereotypes to that degree but i mean again like if they you know this doesn't apply, this kind of i mean i'm saying that you know this is the kind of luxury that one has when one lives in a tranquil society in a peaceful society in which there aren't constant emergencies where we can have an open dialogue have open discussion go into matters uh, and discover things that are not obvious that are perhaps counterintuitive that hold the keys to really solving a lot of problems and you don't get to do any of that certainly if you're a police officer and if you have a nasty job to do or, or a dangerous job to do or a risky job to do and you're under a lot of stress and perhaps you don't have the moral depth to actually deal with these things and so maybe you do turn your stereotypes into a prejudiced or bigoted attitude or maybe you at least have some some small nuance but I mean you know these are you can't expect policemen to get this right when culture has got it so wrong right now. And it's, and in some sense, it's not white America that has this wrong. It's black lives matter America that has this wrong. It's black Lives matter America that is actually promulgating the ideology of the, of the racialist uh, um, leverager of, of stereotype. And, and as they do that about the whole society, how, uh, um, how can they expect there not to be a reaction? And obviously that's going to be worse for everyone that there is going to be a reaction. But at some point, people have to point out the, the fucking hypocrisy um, and the unsustainability of this political hysteria um, and using the same button to essentially cry wolf. Um, which, I mean, you can say that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's purely constructed out of optics. If you actually had an even reporting of crime in some sense, or in all of its different manifestation. Let's just say if you that you're not allowed to report an a particular incident unless you report a demographically representative spread of every other kind of incident. If you had that kind of measure and standard in journalism, this thing would probably, you know, like people would, would actually realize why the stereotype exists in some sense. Uh, or, or they would develop more stereotypes about police and about maybe they would develop more nuanced stereotypes about police and then we would actually understand that yeah actually there's a mix of police there's good police there's a few bad police and you know like and and the kind of uh, uh, outcomes that result from the kinds of mistakes that police make if we uh, and and the kind of risks that police have to take if if the journalists reported on the deaths of policemen which they don't so we're getting this very hyper-realistic window into reality and it's disgusting frankly i mean it's a fucking diversion it's a big fucking waste of time that gets us very far away from actual liberal democratic politics but it seems that that's what the ideology what this one party one state or, or the transnational identitarian nationalistic ideology wants the the ident the identitarianistic uh, 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 you know, um, uh, uh, worldview and and uh, uh, political economy, w w which can be so accommodating of kleptocratic, o oligarchical type elites in a country, which can, just can go completely unnoticed, because all they have to do is virtue signal with the latest rationalist alignment 
of this bullshit narrative and they just have to sort of nod on with it and they just have to sort of say yes yes black lives matter or some you know and, and it just it, it's uh, um I mean, frankly, that, that's what pisses me off because it's just it's such a huge diversion from actually getting anywhere in anything and doing any kind of intelligent political government stuff. And then that's also why you get these crazes over COVID-19 and things like that, where, you know, all of these things are just, it's, it's not even based on science. It's based on this cherry-picked hysterical interpretation of science. Anyway, I'm not going to repeat the stuff over COVID-19.